All right, let's kick it. Introduction to corporate finance. By the way, uh, this is undoubtedly the second class you've taken in this. The first one they called, what, financial management, and this is advanced financial management. I teach another one called making financial. Oh my goodness, all those mean exactly the same thing. So you're gonna see it called corporate finance, financial, financial management, managerial finance. Do not let that freak you out. This is all the same. Um, so let's talk about, we're going to examine the firm from the balance sheet perspective. And earlier I asked you what the balance sheet equation is, and boop, there it is. Assets is equal to uh, liabilities plus owner's equity. So uh, we're going to use that in our thought process as we just start talking about what we're going to do in corporate finance. And the first thing to know is that assets are things that are owned by the company and expected to provide economic benefit going into the future. And so we're thinking about tangible things like property, plant, and equipment. We're also talking about intangible things like patents, copyrights, intellectual property, like that. Okay, now, what about liabilities? Well, that's money that you owe. And we usually think of debt. Now, there are other kinds of liabilities. We can have tax liabilities. But if you think of it this way, it's just money that you owe, money that you owe. And then we have owner's equity. With owner's equity, if we sold all the assets and paid off all the liabilities, what's left is the owner's equity. And that is the part of the company that represents the owner's wealth uh, as a result of this company. And so uh, that owner's equity, if you're a you, you've got your own small business, that's just you, right? But if it's a public corporation, that money belongs to the shareholders. That money belongs to the shareholders. Okay, now we say equity is a residual claim. Residual, the word residue means leftover. And so what we're saying here is that the owners get the leftover cash flows of the firm. Now, I hate leftover food, I detest it, but I do like leftover money. And here's the way this works, is we have this line of people at the company who are getting paid. And at the very front of the line is the government. What's the government demanding from you? Yes. Taxes, right? And then behind them, you've got the workers, you've got suppliers, you've got the people that you owe money to in the form of debt. And after you've paid off all those other people, here's the shareholder standing at the back of the line. And if there's any money left after everybody else is getting paid, everybody else gets paid, that money belongs to the shareholders. Now, here's the bad part. Sometimes the leftover money is negative, right? The leftover money is negative. And as a result, the value of the owner's stake in the company goes down. And so we can actually see owner's equity in a firm go down. Okay, now we're going to see that this whole order of how people get paid is going to impact our decision on what we're going to focus on as financial managers. So here we are in corporate finance, and we're trying to answer these three questions. And the number one question is, what long-term assets should be purchased by the firm? Can anyone tell me what we mean by long-term in finance and accounting? A year. Anything more than a year, right? Anything more than a year. So we're not necessarily talking 34 years, though we could be. Uh, so, so we know that assets are things that we expect to provide economic benefit, and with the word long-term, we're saying beyond one year into the future. Now the question is, what, are we, what should we buy? And this question we call the capital budgeting question. So each one of these questions has a name, and they all have the word capital in them. So uh, this is how I help to remember the names of these questions. Now the second one is, now that we know what we're going to buy, we have to figure out how we're going to pay for it. Right? We've got to figure out how we're going to pay for it. And at the firm, we can, by the way, as individuals, we can either use debt, we can borrow money to buy a car, or we could use cash we already had in our account. That would be equity. And it's the same way at the firm. They can use debt 
or equity. But the firm also has the ability to go out and issue additional shares to raise additional equity, which is a, a privilege that we don't have as individuals. Okay, now it turns out that this mixture of debt and equity that we use to finance the firm's assets is known as the capital structure. So the capital structure is merely the mix of debt and equity we use to finance the firm's assets. By the way, if I say something more than once, do you think it might be important? Yeah. Capital structure is the mix of debt and equity used to finance the firm's assets. So we call that the capital structure question. And then we have the third question, which is how do we manage the short-term operating cash flows of the firm? Remember short-term, we're talking one year or less. And uh, we call this working capital management. Do you remember something called networking capital? What's the formula for networking capital? Very good, current assets minus current liabilities. Now, we want our current assets to be greater than our current liabilities because if not, we're not going to be able to pay our bills over the next year. Remember, current assets are things we expect to produce cash within one year, and current liabilities are things we expect to consume cash within one year. And so we always want that networking capital to be greater than zero. And that's what uh, question three is all about, is about managing those short-term cash flows. Now you say, well, wait a minute, wouldn't we be better off just to keep a bunch of cash around and that way we wouldn't have any risk of having a problem? Why might that not be a good idea? That's when you get bought out. Okay, so it makes you an attractive takeover target. I like that. What's that? Okay, so if we kept a lot of cash though, so why do companies go bankrupt? Because they don't have cash to pay their bills. Uh, this is, and this is an odd thought for a lot of students. Can a profitable company go bankrupt? The answer is yes. Can a, uh, an unprofitable company stay in business? The answer is yes. Uh, and, and here's why. Because bankruptcy is merely precipitated by them not having enough cash to pay their bills right now. And so you could have a company that was profitable on the books. They sold a bunch of stuff on credit. They haven't been paid for it yet. But by golly, their creditors are demanding payment right now, and they could go bankrupt. On the other hand, you could have a company that really stunk, General Motors, in 2007, 2008, um, and they're unprofitable, yet they manage to stay afloat. And here's how they do it. As long as you can convince idiots to buy your stock or buy your bonds, you can stay in business, right? Because you just have to keep people having, throwing money at you. And we actually see this quite a bit in the banking world. It's called extend and pretend. Uh, if I don't loan you more money, you're going to go bankrupt. And then how would that look for me as the bank? I'm going to loan you more money so you can pay off the old money that you owe me, and we call that extend and pretend. Okay, now, that's called working capital management. And the question that I'm going to ask you is, of these three questions, which one do you think is most important? Any idea? Yes, why? Because if you don't have your short term figured out, why even bother with long term? Exactly. So my wife and I are planning for retirement, uh, July 31st, 2037. I've already got the date. It's on my calendar. Um, we're planning for retirement, and we're making all these plans. But if I step out in front of the Bearline bus today, by the way, have you seen how old those guys are that drive those buses? Yeah, do you think they've got like cat-like reflexes? Y'all should be more careful crossing the street, right? And so I step out in front of the bear line. I'm looking at Instagram because I'm that old. I'm not a TikToker, right? And, and I get smacked by the bus and killed. Do, do my long-term plans matter at all? No, long-term doesn't matter if you don't take care of things in the short term. So that's why I would tell you that number three is the most important question up here. Is it the sexiest? Absolutely not. Number one to me is the sexiest. Number two it comes a close second. And number three sounds rather workaday and pedestrian, but it's not. It's the most important question up here. Okay, now, chapter one is what I would call a potpourri. 
It's where we have a bunch of stuff put together that doesn't necessarily all fit together. It's the, the pot that we put all the stuff in that didn't fit in another chapter, but it's all very basic stuff, so here we go. Uh, we're we're going to change gears here, and we're going to talk about where we see financial managers in the organization. And something that uh, the students have trouble understanding is how the board of directors, the chairman of the board, or chairperson of the board, and the CEO, how those all things relate. So let's start at the very top. The board of directors is elected by the shareholders. The board of directors is elected by the shareholders. By the way, as the owners of the firm, the shareholders are the decision makers at the firm. I don't know what's wrong with this thing today. There we go. Uh, the, uh, the shareholders are the decision makers. Now, here's the problem. We have thousands, if not millions, of shareholders. And there is no way for these people to all jump on a Zoom call every day and say, what are we going to do with our company today? It's just not going to happen. And so instead, that decision-making ability is delegated to the board of directors. The shareholders get to vote on who goes on the board. And then the board has basically three very important jobs. Number one, hiring managers. So typically what the board will go out and do is find the person they think will be the best CEO for the firm. Now, technically they are able to hire the other managers of the firm, but more often what they'll do is they'll hire the CEO and then when one of these other positions comes open, the CEO will have someone that they've worked with previously that they like. So uh, how many of you have ever been on a team? Yeah, I mean, do you, so do you trust the people on your team more than maybe a stranger off the street? Yeah, and it's the same thing in industry. When I worked at Halliburton, the vice president of manufacturing had been hired out of General Electric. And then it was just amazing how the organization started to fill out with GE people as the old guard left or were fired or laid off, right? So he was bringing in people that he knew and trusted. Now, the board of directors for those C-level jobs, of course, they're going to be able to give their approval or denial for those, but that's what's going on there. So that's number one, hiring. Number two, compensating managers. What do you think we mean by compensating? Yeah, how are we going to pay them? How are we going to uh, make it worth their while to do this thing for us? And not only that, to incentivize them to behave in a way that's going to meet this goal of financial management, which we'll talk about here in a bit. So we've got hiring, we've got compensating, and then we have firing. Even more important, potentially, than hiring the CEO is the job of firing the CEO when they're doing a bad job. So now we know the board of directors are not really employees of the firms. They are the elected representatives of the shareholders. The top employee at the firm typically is called the chief executive officer. And then below them, we have some other folks. Directly below the chief executive officer, we have the chief operating officer. Now, the chief, chief operating officer is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the firm. They're responsible for executing. They're responsible for keeping things moving in the right direction. The big difference between the CEO and the COO, uh, two, two big differences. Number one, the CEO is sort of outward facing. They're supposed to be looking at the external environment and coming up with a strategy for the firm going forward. The chief operating officer is more inwardly focused. We're gonna make the trains run on time. We're gonna meet our production goals. We're gonna make sure we have enough capacity to do this thing that the CEO has dreamed up. Now, not everyone has within them the natural skills and abilities to be a CEO. I know that I don't, and here's why. I'm not a visionary. I don't have a vision. The visionary in my family is my wife. She's the one who suggested that we become professors. I would have never even thought about doing this job, but she's like, hey, let's quit our jobs and go to doctoral school. It took a couple of years, but finally we did, right? Uh, so she is the visionary. I am the one that 
makes it all happen. And so she's the CEO, I'm kind of the COO, if you want to think of it in those terms. And then we have the top financial thinker uh, at the firm who works for the COO, and that is the chief financial officer. The chief financial officer, or CFO. By the way, sometimes at firms, these titles will have slightly different uh, names. Don't let that freak you out. We can, we can look at any organizational structure and say, aha, this person's a CFO, this one's the CEO. Sometimes you'll see the CEO called a president. Uh, you know, it, it gets kind of messy, but don't let that freak you out. Now, here's what you need to know about the CFO. The CFO is over basically two groups of financial thinkers. They are over the finance people and they're over the accounting people. And on the finance side of the house, we have the treasurer. The treasurer is the top pure finance person in the firm. And underneath the treasurer, we have four positions here. And of course, once again, this is going to vary from company to company, but this is typically the way it works. We have the cash manager. Which of the three questions do you think the cash manager is concerned about? Yeah, the working capital management, question number three. Then we also have the credit managers. By the way, in business, we typically are not selling our products or services for cash. We are typically selling them on credit, which is a promise to pay at some point in the future. And so we have to have someone uh, basically manage that process. If we extend credit to too many people, or bad people, then we end up not getting paid, right? If we don't extend enough credit, maybe it hurts our sales. And so there's this delicate balance to be struck. Knowing now what the credit manager does, which of the three questions do you think that they do, that they're involved with? It's also question number three, right? Because the accounts receivable, typically, that's when we extend credit, we're extending it on a 30, 60, 90 day timeline. That's less than a year. And so we're gonna say that that credit manager is also working on question number three. And then we have capital expenditures. This is the group that goes out and looks, by the way, they don't come up with the ideas. The ideas for the, the things that we need to buy come from other places in the organization. But the capital expenditures group is the one that crunches the numbers and helps to choose which projects we take on. And I'm going to teach you how to pick good projects and how to know which ones just to get rid of. But that's what the capital expenditures group does. Which of the three questions are they involved in? Yeah, number one, capital budgeting. And then uh, we have our financial planning group. They are the people that go out and find the money that's necessary to buy the assets that the capital expenditures group is saying we should buy. Now that comes down to question two, right? The capital structure question. Uh, are we going to borrow the money? Are we going to issue additional shares? Are we going to use the money we have in the checking account? How are we going to pay for that? So that's the financial side of the house. Now on the other side of the house, we have the top accountant at the firm. And the top accountant at the firm is called the controller. And you may also see it spelled like this. <coughs> And you will hear people pronounce that as comptroller. Not correct. Not correct. This is actually a French word. And when you say words in French, a lot of the letters get dropped out. And so here's what it sounds like. Controller, right? My French accent is awful. OK, now, can, so when you say it in, in French, it actually sounds like controller, right? And a lot of people get confused. They'll either call it comptroller, which is not correct, or they'll say, well, the controller must certainly be in control of the firm. Wrong. The controller is just the top accountant at the firm. Okay, now, who works for the controller? Number one, the tax manager. Why do you think the tax manager might be important? By the way, what do you think the job of a tax manager might be? 
to understand and pay the tax liability. Yeah. Okay. So not only to understand and pay the tax liability, which we enjoy, I, I love accounts because they keep us out of prison, right? I don't want to go to prison. Exactly. Oh, she's a business thinker. Okay. So now, how to reduce taxes within the law. Oh, she's disappointed in me now. Okay, so it's how to reduce taxes within the law. And so, uh, for instance, every year when I file my taxes, uh, by the way, I use TurboTax, right? I'm not a tax genius. So, but I go in there and I put all my stuff in. And it says, if you take the standard deduction, your tax will be X. If you itemize deduction, your tax will be Y. Which way do I choose to, to do it? Yeah, whichever gives me the lower tax liability, right? Have I broken any laws? No, I'm not going to prison over that, right? Uh, but there are, I can pay different amounts of taxes depending on how I do things within the law. So that's the job of the tax manager. Now, if you hear people talk about the tax manager being aggressive, that means that they're playing kind of fast and loose with the tax rules and there's a good chance that they're going to end up in prison. Don't be that person, right? By the way, if you guys need any convincing about staying out of federal prison, let me know, and I will bring my friend Mark in. Mark did seven years in federal prison for running a mini Ponzi scheme, and he's, he was at what you guys would call Club Fed, right? The, 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 the easiest of federal prisons. Not fun. If you need convince, let me know. I'll bring him in. I'm hoping. You, you, you need convinced? Maybe I need to just have set up a like coffee for you and him so he can give you individual attention. Okay. Uh, then we have the cost accounting manager. Now, this sounds like a pretty lame job. Well, that thing costs $1.68, right? And that part is easy. But the problem is this. Do you think all the costs at the company can be directly attributed to, a, no. And so we end up with this whole concept of having to figure out how we're going to distribute those costs among the different operations of the firm. So for example, here in this building, we have all these lights that are running all day long, right? And there's electricity involved in that. And so if only finance, economics, and resource uh, re risk management are using this classroom, we could use this, we could just give those costs to my department. However, what about the lights in the hallway? No, we've got to figure out how to divvy that up amongst the departments, right? Now, that doesn't sound sexy or exciting, but it's not easy. And that's why we have cost accountants. And then we have the financial accounting manager. The financial accounting manager is responsible for preparing the financial statements of the firm. Now, financial statements of the firm, why are they important? If you are a publicly traded company in the United States, every three months you have to submit your financial statements to the Securities and Exchange Commission. And so the financial manager, financial accounting manager, needs to make sure that our financial statements are correct. By the way, do you think it's embarrassing when someone points out that we have messed up our financial statements? Oh yeah. Do you think people might lose their jobs over that sort of stuff? Oh, very definitely. And so financial accounting managers, it's their job to make sure that the statements are correct. And by the way, what do you think happens to a firm's stock price when it says, uh-oh, we've got to restate our financial statements? Yeah, it goes down, because even if the thing that you're having to restate about is not that bad, it lets everybody know that you're a bunch of idiots, right? And if you've got a bunch of idiots running the ship, it's probably going to run aground. Okay, so that's why the financial accounting manager is important. And then we have the information systems manager. Notice that in this way that we've got this organization set up here, the computer people are under the accountants. That is becoming less and less true over time. You'll see a CIO, Chief Information Officer, or CTO, Chief Technology Officer, that is probably on the same level of the organization as the CFO. But why would we see computers under the accounting people? It's because in the beginning, that's what computers were used for at firms. 
The year is 1964. My mom is a, uh, she did one year as a high school math teacher and she decided that kids suck. And so she decided she was getting out of teaching, right? She gave me such grief when I got into this line of work. Okay, now, what does she do? She goes to work at a stone quarry where they were taking out limestone. And they had just bought one of the very first computers. I am so amazed my mom got to work on this thing. But it was like the size of this room and had to be air conditioned because it created a lot of heat. But the only thing this thing was capable of in the beginning was issuing the bills for when people bought stone or agricultural lime, things like that. But then they figured out over time that it could do more than that. Hey, this thing could also keep track of the people, of the money that people owe to us, the money that we owe to people. And we can actually use it to do our accounting transactions. And so that is how, uh, that's the first use of computers at firms, was in this accounting role. And so that's why traditionally you have seen the computer folks be located under accountants. Once again, it's becoming less and less true over time. This is a sign that I've been talking too long. Okay. Now, once again, we're going to shift gears here, and we're going to discuss the concepts of limited versus unlimited liability. <clears throat> Let's start with the first one. Let's start with unlimited liability. Unlimited liability means that me, as the owner of the firm, that I um, am responsible for all the debts of the firm, regardless of how big those debts become. Sorry, my nose is giving me a little trouble today. Okay, um, that means even if you only had a small amount invested in the company and you did something stupid and you got sued for it and the decision was much, much greater than the assets of the firm, you're still on the hook for all that stuff. You're still got to pay for all that. Compare that to limited liability, which is where our equity investors or the owner is only responsible for the debts of the firm up to the amount that they had invested in it. In other words, let's say I've got $100,000 invested in this firm and I have a limited liability. I get sued for a million dollars. What's the worst that's going to happen to me? I'm going to lose my $100,000 firm. That's it. But if I have unlimited liability, I'll be on the hook for the entire amount. Which sounds better so far? Yeah, limited liability. In fact, uh, let me give you an example. I lived in Mississippi. My wife and I, that's where we started our teaching careers, was at University of Southern Mississippi. And we hired this guy named Mark to mow our yard. And Mark had a pickup truck, a trailer, and a lawnmower. And it cost, he, so all of that investment is around $10,000. And so Mark comes out and he's mowing my yard and he's got his headphones on. Back then we didn't have earbuds. He had his headphones on and he's listening to ACDC. He's rocking out. He's having a really good time. And suddenly he feels the lawnmower shake. And he looks around and he sees this thin mist of blood and lots of tufts of fur in the air. And he looks around and he sees the neighbor lady standing at the edge of her yard with this horrified look on her face and three young children behind her who just saw their dog run under his mower and die. Okay, now, Mark feels bad. By the way, this is Mississippi. Everyone except for one person I knew in Mississippi loves dogs. I mean, we're dog people, right? So, love dogs, but... Uh, do you think it's going to be enough that Mark feels very bad that he did this and says, oh, ma'am, I'm so sorry that your dog is dead? Is that going to, is that going to, is this, she's going to say, yeah, don't worry about it. No. So here's what you need to know about this dog. Uh, he went by Fluffy, though his name was Sir Charles Fluffmeister IV. He was one of those registered champion show dog kind of, yeah, oh, yeah, they all have weird names. And uh, now he was retired from being a show dog but he was now out to stud, which if you don't know what that is, look it up. It's a pretty sweet gig. Okay, so he's, he's out to stud, 
And so his, uh, his market value was around $50,000. Oh, yeah. Now, if, if Mark knew that, if he said, well, ma'am, let me write you a check for $50,000, do you think that's going to be enough? No, why not? Because of the offspring and business. Okay, so let's say that the, so the market value would be the present value of all those cash flows. So we've got that in the $50,000. The motion? Yes, oh my goodness. These poor children saw their family dog. This is my Mississippi invitation. Saw their family dog massacred before them. Certainly you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, can, can agree that this dog was worth at least $2 million. The judge, by the way, the, the jury agrees. $2 million. The judge says, that's ridiculous. By the way, it sounds the same as the lawyer, right? That's ridiculous. Why, that dog was worth no more than $1 million. So, there's your decision. Mark has to pay a million dollars. Mark goes home to his wife, and he says, she says, how did it go in court? He says, we lost. She says, how bad? He says, $1 million. And she said, well, I guess you're going to lose your business. He says, oh, no. It's more than that. The lawyer says, because I have unlimited liability, that they can come after our personal assets. They can take our house. They can take the kid's college fund. They can take you name it. They can take it. Right? There are very few of these personal assets that are protected. I think retirement funds like 401k and stuff like that are protected. But the rest of it, it's uh, basically theirs for the taking. So do you think Mark is going to be able to pay that amount of money? No. So he's either going to have to declare bankruptcy or he's going to spend the rest of his life trying to pay off Fluffy. Have I illustrated to you the importance of avoiding unlimited <coughs> liability? Now, students, uh, by the way, I was, I was telling a story one time and there was a young lady sitting right here and the tears were streaming down her cheeks as I told this story because she was thinking about the poor dog. I said, oh, honey, don't cry. It's just bullshit, right? It's not a true story. And then you say, wait a minute. Why would you torture me like that? And the answer is this. I want you to have a deep emotional response any time that you get anywhere near to getting unlimited liability, right? I want you to have that deep emotional response. Wouldn't you carry like an umbrella insurance or something under those circumstances? Okay, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about the kind of people who wind up uh, getting this particular form of, hang on here, I'm going to sign off my watch. Uh, the kind of people that get into this are typically, and we're going to see this here in a little bit, different legal forms of business. They're called sole proprietors. And so basically, uh, Mark was good at mowing yards. Do you think Mark knows anything about accounting? Do you think he knows anything about finance? No. Do you think he knows the law? No. Do you think he even contemplated that some mongrel would run under his lawnmower? No, he's a careful guy, right? Why would he need that, right? He doesn't, and by the way, you don't need it to do business in Mississippi, right? There's no legal requirement. And so, of course not, he's not going to have that because it doesn't even cross his mind. And this is what we see with a lot of small business people. Uh, people get into the cake decorating business not because they think, well, I'd like to start a business. What shall I do? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll learn how to decorate cakes. Now, how do they get into it? First, they're decorating cakes for their friends. And their friends are like, you're really good at this. You should have a business. And so they go out and start a business. But they don't know anything about this. And so they end up making some poor decisions that put them in this situation. And we're going to talk about how they end up there and how we can avoid that. Any questions in the meantime? Okay, so the dog was just fine. The year was 2006. I assume he has now passed on of natural circumstances, right? Otherwise, he would be terribly, terribly old because he was retired then. Now, how can we avoid this limited or this unlimited liability? And the answer comes from the form of business that you choose, the legal form for the firm. And we're going to talk about these different forms that you can choose, and we're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each. And the first one is called the sole proprietorship. 
Sole means one or only. A proprietor is an owner. By the way, I know students are tempted to look at the clock during class. I can see it and I guarantee you I will not keep you past 12, 15. If I do, you'd be sure to call me out, right? Because I, I will, I, that's, I'm really good about that. Okay, now, sole proprietorship, one owner firm. Uh, how do you become a sole proprietor? Uh, let's say that during the recent snowstorm, you're like, whoa, wait a minute, I can go out and make some money. So you take your snow shovel and you offer to shovel Mrs. Jones' sidewalk. And she gives you $20 for it. Congratulations, you are now a sole proprietor. You can accidentally become a sole proprietor. So, does a sole proprietorship have a limited liability? No, they have unlimited liability. In fact, this was the problem with Mark and his lawn mowing business. He knew a lot about lawns. The man was a magician with grass, but he was a sole proprietor because he did not recognize this problem. He just kind of started mowing lawns for money. Uh, now, let's, the next uh, thing we're going to talk about is double taxation. And in order for us to understand what double taxation is, I need to jump down to the corporation and then we'll come back and talk about sole proprietorships. At the corporation, when a company makes money, they pay corporate income tax. Corporate income tax. We typically say 35%, but of course we know that the tax manager is going to do his very best to get that lower. Um, so we got this uh, corporate tax, uh, so we got a dollar comes in, we have to pay 35 cents worth of taxes. Now there's 65 cents left over. Who's the owner of the firm? The shareholders are the owners of the firm. How do we get that money to them? We pay a dividend. And now that dividend is also taxed. That dividend is also taxed. And how the dividend is taxed varies through time. It used to be taxed as regular income. And then it was taxed at a special rate and now it is totally all messed up with this qualified and unqualified dividends and crap like this, and I let TurboTax figure it out for me. But uh, the, the, I do know this one thing. I have to pay taxes on my dividends, and that's what we mean by double taxation. When money comes into the corporation, we have to pay taxes, and then when the money is distributed to the owners of the firm, you have to pay taxes again. We don't have double taxation at the sole proprietorship because the profits to a sole proprietorship are taxed like ordinary income. The profits to a sole proprietorship are taxed like ordinary income. In other words, the, the income tax that Mark paid on his profits of his lawn business were the same income taxes that I was paying. Now there's one difference. I'm paying Social Security and Medicare basically half of it. My employer pays the other half. As a self-employed person, Mark had additional taxes. But we're talking purely about the income taxes here. They're the same. And so that's only single taxation. Now, the, the next question is, is it easy to transfer the ownership of the sole proprietorship? And the answer is no. You might say, well, wait a minute. It would be really easy for Mark to sell his truck, his trailer, and his lawnmower. And it would be. But would that be the entire value of the firm? Now, what else is going on at the firm that might be worth more? Brand value. Yeah, so Mark was Extreme Lawn Care, LLC. I don't know what was the extreme about it, but everybody knew that Mark did a good job. Now, typically, people who pay to have their lawns mowed, are they there during the day to see their lawn getting mowed? Typically, no, they're at work, right? And so, basically, Mark could sell this Entity is a going concern to someone else for more than the sum of the fair market value of his assets. And so here's the problem though. Do you think any small business owner truly knows what their business is worth? No, they have no idea. And so they're going to have to either approach a consultant that will help, their, help them value the business or a business broker who's going to help them find a buyer for the business. Either way, they're going to end up paying some money for that privilege. Why are they willing to do it? Because they're going to receive so much more for the firm that it's worth it to pay the broker's commission. By the way, a broker's commission on selling a business is around 
It's around 10%. If you sell real estate in the United States, it's 6%. Business is a little more tough, so you're looking at 10%. Uh, is it easy to find someone who wants to be uh, doing what you're doing, uh, where you're at, at this time? It's not. And that's why we have to engage these brokers. And so it's really not that easy to transfer ownership of a sole proprietorship. Now, let's talk about perpetual succession. Perpetual means goes on forever. Perpetual means goes on forever. And we're going to see when we talk about corporations that corporations have perpetual succession. But the sole proprietorship does not. The legal company, the sole proprietorship, dies with the owner. Even if you left your sole proprietorship to your kids, uh, to let's say one kid, so we take it a one-to-one -one transfer, that old sole proprietorship is gone. The new sole proprietorship is now starting with your, with your child or whoever you leave the business to. And so there's not perpetual succession there. Is it easy for these people to raise capital? Now, when we talk about capital, we're talking about these funds to buy long-term assets. So Seth, we're going to borrow money, money for more than a year out there. Is it easy for a sole proprietor to raise funds? The answer is no. I'll give you an example. I, my, in fact, he's my current landscaping guy. He was in my class, this is like 2007, 2008. And uh, he was starting his business back then. And he had picked out this fancy mower that he wanted. And he went down to the dealership and figured out he would need $10,000 to buy this mower. And he goes to his bank. And he walks in and introduces himself to the commercial loan officer. And the loan officer says, how can I help you? And my student says, I have a dream. And the loan officer says, tell me your dream. He says, I want to have the best landscaping business in all of Springfield. And the loan officer says, that's a great dream. He says, what do you need to get started toward your dream? He said, I need this uh, lawnmower and it's going to cost me $10,000. And the, the loan officer says, okay, how much do you have now? And my student said, nothing. What do you think happened next? Yeah, stop wasting my time. Don't even take a lollipop out of the bowl on your way out. You're gone, right? Bank's not going to talk to him. And so my student went down to the dealership and was standing in front of the lawnmower of his dream. I know that seems like an odd thing, but it's standing in front of the lawnmower of his dreams, and he's mourning, he's grieving, because he knows he can't buy it. The tears are streaming down his cheeks. The salesperson says, sir, what's wrong? He says, this is the lawnmower of my dream, but I can't buy it because the bank won't loan me the money. The salesperson says, don't worry. What do you think, what do you think the salesman's going to propose? Finance. Yeah, we can finance it for you. Now, why is the dealership willing to finance when the bank would not? Because the dealership's getting something additional out of it. They're also getting the profit from the sale, right? And so it's worth it a little more to them than it would be to the bank. Now, do you think it's going to probably be a little more expensive for, for my student? Yeah, probably so. Because if, if people know you don't have other options, what are they going to do with the price of anything? Right? That's how monopolies work. Okay, so he went ahead and did his financing that way. Now, years later, he has good relationships with more than one bank, and they're always willing to loan him money because he has a proven track record. Plus, he has 20% down for anything that he buys, right? He's got money. But in the beginning, that's not the case. So where do these people typically get their money to start out with? Family, friends. They typically uh, borrow money up front. And in fact, this guy, he borrowed a lot of money from his parents to get the business going. And then he was very clever, though. Instead of paying them back in cash, he paid them back in services. So he'd like build a retaining wall at their house and say, well, that was a $20,000 retaining wall. Right? OK. Now, uh, is it easy to start? By the way, we're going to rank these. The easiest one's going to be one. The most difficult will be four. 
And it is the easiest thing in the world to start a sole proprietorship. I've already told you, you can do it accidentally. And so that's why we have so many people who are out there as sole proprietors. Uh, in fact, the most common small business, most common form of business in the United States is the sole proprietorship. The most popular or common type of business in the United States is the sole proprietorship. And it's simply because it's just so easy to start, you can do it accidentally. By the way, that'll be a test question. And the most common wrong answer will be corporation. Because that's what people are familiar with, right? You don't realize that you're interacting with sole proprietors every single day of the world. Now, how in the world could I get rid of uh, this, this one? Oh, sorry, I'm skipping ahead here. Uh, next, we want to talk about partnerships. Partnerships are a whole lot like sole proprietorships with one big difference. Can anyone tell me what it is? Yeah, two or more people. And so the partnership, you've got more people. Um, you still don't have limited liability. By the way, uh, my remarks here today are about general partnerships. You can have what are called limited partnerships, where you've got one general partner who has unlimited liability, and you've got limited partners who have limited liability. By the way, who do you think gets a bigger cut of the profits? It's got to be the general partner, because if, if you don't already know this, risk and reward have to go together. Risk and reward have to go together. In my hometown, there were three basic industries. There were, uh, we made bed springs, we made cheese, and we made dynamite. Now, of those, which, which job do you think had to pay the most? The dynamite. dynamite. Both of my grandfathers, my dad, my uncle, all worked in the dynamite plants. There were two of them. They had to pay more because it was riskier. My dad actually got blown up in 66 and again in 72. The first time he hid behind a big oak tree, second time he hid under a, a flatbed trailer to avoid the fallout, uh, but it was dangerous. They got paid more than anyone else in town. Now, the next most dangerous industry was the bed spring factory. And the bed spring factory, you had to work, in fact, I, you would go around and see people in town and they would have scars on their hands and you could see that a piece of wire just shot straight through their hand when they're making these springs. That was common injury. So that was the second best paid job in town. And then at the bottom of the barrel were the cheese people. You think making cheese is very dangerous? No, not really. The, the biggest problem with the cheese was that it would get caked in their shoes and they ended up smelling like cat manure. It was weird. So the, the cheese goes bad after a while, it gets rancid. And so most, you could almost walk by people's cars and smell the trunk and know that they worked at the cheese factory. Because of course, were they allowed to wear those boots into the house? Absolutely not, so they stayed in the trunk of the car. Okay, now, I'm telling you that this is the relationship between risk and reward. The more risk there is, the higher the reward has to be. And so if you've got two kinds of partners here, one that has unlimited liability and the other one has limited, the unlimited has the higher risk. Therefore, they have to get more reward. Okay, now, is it easy? Oh, so by the way, the partners just divvy up the profit and that's treated as regular income to them. My sister is a partner in a business and basically it's 25, 25, 25, 25. They all get one fourth. And so my sister has her one fourth of the profits and that's taxed to her as regular income. Is it easy to transfer ownership? No, it's actually harder than a sole proprietorship because now not only do we have to find a buyer for it, we have to get all the partners to agree. So let's say I'm, I'm 52 years old. I'm gonna ask you, how old are you? You don't want to say it? I bet you're younger than I am. <laughs> Let me ask you this question. How many years until you retire? <laughs> Long time. You guys already know that I have my date written down, right? July 31st, 2037. Okay, so I'm only in this game for another 13 years. And you and I become partners. And after 13 years, I'm like, whoop, time to hang it up. Let's sell the business. What do you say? I can still run it. Yeah, so, but, but I'm saying, well, wait a minute. Oh, okay, I'll sell you my half of the business. Yes, sir. Now what do we have to do? We have to agree on a value for the business, right? 
And she is going to say, this business isn't worth much, right? Because she wants to pay half of not much. I'm going to say, oh my goodness, this business is worth millions because I want half of millions, right? Do you see that this whole partnership angle adds an additional layer of complexity trying to sell the thing? Okay. Dang it. It's a good thing I can remember my password. Okay. Uh, let's see. What about perpetual succession? No. In fact, it's even worse than the sole proprietorship because even if only one of the partners dies, then the partnership is gone and you have to form a new partnership. Um, is it easy to raise capital? It's easier than the sole proprietorship. And here's why. Because now we have the individual wealth of, let's say, four people that can be contributed as equity to the firm. Whereas when we only had a sole proprietor, it was just the individual's wealth that could be the, the equity for the firm. Now, what about going out and borrowing money? Getting back to our example here. Do you think the bank is more likely to loan us money as a partnership or if we were both sole proprietors? As a partnership, and here's why. If I die, what's likely? She's going to still try to make those payments, right? But if you loan money to a sole proprietor and they die, who's left to make the payments? Nobody, right? And so banks are more willing to do business with you as a partnership. Uh, it's also you've got more equity because of the wealth of the individual owners. Okay, now, um, is it easy to start? It's a, little e it's a little harder than sole proprietorship, and here's why. Because we need a partnership agreement. And we and don't ever, ever, ever get into a partnership without a partnership agreement. The partnership agreement's going to cover how we're going to split the proceeds, how we're going to split the profits. It's going to cover uh, what are we going to do if one of us wants to sell, and we're going to end up with something called the right of first refusal. And we're going to, there will be several things that we're going to do in this partnership agreement that are going to be important to us down the road. Now, is it easy to come to terms on the partnership agreement? Get back over here with my partner. I think I should get 70% and you should get 30%. How does that sound? No. No! What do you want? 50-50. Oh my goodness. You, I'm going to teach you a negotiation skill here. <laughs> if you really want 50-50, I'm going to ask Ms. Wynn. What should she ask for? She should say, well, wait a minute, I want 70, right? And then between the two of us, we're going to get back to 50-50. At least ask for 60-40, right? Okay, now, so we're going to have that argument out. And then after we get things written down on the back of a cocktail napkin or whatever, do you think it's legal yet? No, no who do we need to get involved? Lawyer. lawyer. Anybody in here want to be a lawyer? Good. The world has enough lawyers. But here's what you need to know about lawyers. They're expensive. Right? They're expensive. So that's why it's, so, it's harder to start a partnership uh, than a uh, sole proprietorship. Now, let's move on, finally, to the first company that has limited liability, the limited liability company. You may also hear it called LLC. I have an LLC. My wife has an LLC. And the reason, and then we've had them for years, and we've just recently actually started doing business. I think I've made something like $35.68. Uh, you know, it's not much, but we have always had these LLCs for the last few years because we knew if we wanted to do anything, we wanted to have it there and ready to go, right? Because I don't want to ever be the sole proprietor that just trips into unlimited liability. Okay, so we do have limited liability on the limited liability company. And here's how I want you to think of a limited liability company. You've got a cake. By the way, I'm not a great artist, but you've got this cake. And this cake is either a partnership or a sole proprietorship. But I can, on either one of those cakes, I can put on the LLC icing. If I put the LLC icing on my sole proprietorship, 
I have basically everything else is true about this whole proprietorship except for I don't have unlimited liability anymore. If I do this on a partnership, then I no longer have unlimited liability for the partners. And so this, this basically gets rid of one of the disadvantages of sole proprietorship and partnership, and it doesn't really create any additional disadvantages. We're going to see that one of these other forms does. Now, how, you say, wait a minute, this is a very valuable thing. It must be very difficult to get one. Does anyone here have an LLC? How hard was it for you to form your LLC? No, I just went to an attorney. Oh wow, you, you like were ex went expensive. So here's what I did. I went to the Missouri Secretary of State's website and I put in my name and my email address and I made up a funky German name because all good English names were taken and I paid 50 bucks. Woo! Yeah, you wasted your money on a lawyer, bro. I wish I'd known you before now. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm telling you is it's not hard. And so I was telling this to a, a class of China EMBA students, and they said, no one would be stupid enough not to do that. And I said, au contraire, the majority of small businesses in the United States are sole proprietorships. And they said, no, 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 that can't be true. And it was so much fun because they were in my office, like four of them, four of these China EMBA students, and a former student of mine came by. And he said, and he hadn't been my student for like 10 years, but we kept in touch. He came by, he says, I'm so excited. I said, what are you excited about? He says, I just started a business. I said, what's your business? He says, well, he's got, he was from the Marshall Islands. And he says, I've got uh, these Marshallese handicrafts and I've opened up this store and I'm selling stuff and it's great. I'm having a really great time making good money. And I said, and this is in front of all my Chinese students, I said, are you a sole proprietor? And at that moment, it occurred to him, because of course he sat through this lecture, right? His jaw drops, he says, oh, no, I forgot to do an LLC. And suddenly my EMBA students recognized that it's not a matter of being stu stupid, it's a matter of being excited about what you're doing, right? And so people trip into that all the time, so don't let that be you. If you, if you have any entrepreneurial spirit whatsoever, go ahead and spend the 50 bucks, form your LLC, and then when you're like, aha, I'm going to teach tango, now you can do it under the umbrella of LLC. <coughs> now, everything else at the limited liability company is going to be identical to the sole proprietorship if there's only one owner, and to the partnership if there's more than one owner, uh, except for uh, the ease of starting. The ease of starting is a little bit more difficult because, of course, you've got to go out there to the website, type in your stuff, pay your bill, but that's it. Now, let's talk about the last one, the corporation. Corporations have limited liability. The owners of corporations are the shareholders, and the most the shareholders will ever lose is the amount that they paid for the shares. So I bought, uh, in 1998, I bought 10 shares of General Electric for 840 bucks. The most I will ever lose if General Electric does something really stupid is my 840 bucks. They could get sued like crazy and owe way more than the company's worth. The most I will ever lose is my 840 bucks. So, just like a limited liability company, the corporation, the owners have limited liability. But, unfortunately, there are some negatives that go along with that. And the first negative is double taxation. We've already talked about that. From the owner's perspective, uh, the company they own is paying taxes, and then they're paying taxes on the dividends they receive from the company. So that's double taxation. That's not good, right? I don't want to be double taxed. You don't want to be double taxed. But it's something that, as owners of a corporation, we have to put up with. It, but is it easy to transfer ownership? Yes, I see a lot of head nodding. Yes, how can I transfer my ownership in a corporation? Sell the shares. Sell the, shares. the most difficult thing for me about selling stock is to remember the password on my Charles Schwab account. And that's it, right? Once I got that going, boop, I can sell it and be done with it. I don't have to go door to door saying, would you like to buy 10 shares of GE? No, I can just boop, right? Sell it. So that's easy, that's good. 
Another thing that allows, and we're going to see this in Chapter 11, it allows me to hold a diversified portfolio because I can buy a bunch of bunch of different stocks and I can sell, buy and sell them as I like. Does it have perpetual succession? Yes! In the United States, the corporation is considered a legal person with all the rights and obligations of a legal, of, of a human, right? With one exception, corporations can live forever. Corporations can live forever. Uh, I hear of these firms, so if there was a Barings, it's called Barings Bank in uh, Scotland, uh, a, a trader in Singapore made a bad bet and the company went bankrupt. And that's not really a, a big story except for the fact that the company was over 500 years old at the time. Oh yeah. So when do we hear about these businesses? Usually when someone's done something catastrophically stupid and killed them off. There are other companies out there, I am positive, other corporations that have lived longer than that, right? So you can go on forever and ever. Humans, by the way, uh, in these top two, those uh, after the person dies, then it's gone. I assume the same is true of my LLC. Okay, now, is it easy for corporations to raise money? Oh, yeah. First of all, let's, let's retrace our steps back to the bank. Uh, right after my student walks out, Tim Cook walks in. Do you guys know who Tim Cook is? CEO of? Apple. Apple. And they're like, oh, Mr. Cook, thanks for coming. And they offer him uh, a glass of brandy and a cigar. They say, it's illegal to smoke inside, but for you, Mr. Cook, we'll make an exception, right? And they're like, what can we do for you today? Do you notice the difference in tone between him and the guy with the lawnmower? Oh, yeah. So banks are more willing to loan money to you. Not only that, where else can I borrow money if I'm a corporation? Supplier. Say again? Like okay, so yeah, we'll, we'll sure. short term. You're getting closer. Uh, the bond market, yeah. right? So we can go and sell bonds publicly. That's how we borrow money from just the general public, is to go issue bonds. So that's, we have better relationships with the banks, we have another public way to raise debt, and we can also issue equity. We can sell shares. Remember that for the top three things here, we're talking about just the personal wealth of the owners is the only equity that's available to them. But if you're a corporation, you can sell equity to people like me, and I'll buy shares and hold them in, your, in, your, uh, in my portfolio. Is it easy to start a corporation? Absolutely not. So you've got to go through basically everything that you would for some of these other things. Plus, you're going to have to go through, um, fit, first of all, you could choose a state to incorporate in. Most people use Delaware. Unless they are tax cheats, then they like to use uh, Nevada. So if you're a tax cheat, there's your, there you go, Nevada. Uh, Nevada Corporation, they don't have reciprocity with the IRS. In other words, they're not going to tell the IRS what they know about your business. And so if you see someone with a Nevada corporation, they're probably scumbags. Okay, yeah, they might not be, but they probably are. Um, so what else do we have? So you've got reporting requirements. Remember we talked about the SEC and having to file your financial statements? And so there's all sorts of stuff that goes on with a corporation that we don't have with the other forms of business. And you say, well, wait a minute. It's harder to start, and uh, you got this double taxation thing. Why in the world would anyone want to do that? Well, let's use an example that you might be familiar with. Do you guys know about Facebook? Yeah, so let's, let's talk about Facebook. We've got Mark Zuckerberg, and let's say that in the beginning, he had a partner named Fred. And Mark and Fred, the only equity in that firm was what they had put into it. But then they figure out that the market potential is so huge that they could never fund the expansion of Facebook using purely their own funds. And the first thing they do is go to the bank, and probably the person at the bank has never even heard social media. And so eventually what they end up having to do is to become a corporation so they can issue equity uh, outside. Now. Why in the world would they do this? Let's think about it currently. Mark is getting 50% of the money, and Fred is getting 50% of the money. Why in the world would they want to sell off 50% of the firm to outsiders, and then uh, Mark is now getting 25%, and 
and Fred is getting 25%. And the answer is this, which would you rather have? Half of a small pizza or 25% of the extra extra large? I'd rather have the 25% of the extra extra large. It's actually more square inches of pizza, right? That, so I, it always cracks me up to walk into the pizza place and they've got the pans up on the wall and there's always some idiot at the front of the line that says, uh, how many slices is that? Pal, we can cut it in as many slices as you want, right? What we're really talking about here is square inches of pizza, and the problem is people can't look at it and do the math in their heads. Okay, back to the story. It's because of the growth opportunities. If you are an LLC, by the way, you can switch back and forth between these. It takes some doing, but you can. Uh, if you're an LLC, there is no reason to become a corporation unless you have growth opportunities that you just cannot fund with your personal wealth and whatever money you can borrow down at the bank. Let me say that one more time. If you're an LLC, there is no reason to form a corporation unless you've got these growth opportunities that you need to fund. By the way, getting back to Mark and Fred, now uh, in addition to having to share the money, they're going to have to share control. Do people like to share control? No! Uh, so. Uh, when my wife and I go somewhere, I want to drive, right? And when we're sitting on the couch, uh, who, who do you think has the remote, right? Because I'm, I'm mad, power, mad with power, right? I want control. People want control. And so basically, uh, oh, we're not going to turn that back on because we're almost done. Uh, that's, that's another downside to forming a corporation is you lose a bit of that control. Next time, we will finish up this first set of slides, and we will also cover the agency problem, and maybe we'll get into chapter three. So go ahead, read the chapter, print out the slides, and bring them with you next time. I will see you on Tuesday.